Douglas McWilliam, he's CEO of the Centre for Economic and Business Research, and he joins us now uh, from Singapore. Doug uh, McWilliam, thanks very much indeed for joining us. First of all, right, so it is uh, all about the Eurozone. Now, you're the, one of the, uh, the people who's predict predicting the Eurozone will actually break apart in the next few years. Uh, do you still stand by that? It looks likely. It looks more and more likely, I'm afraid. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the European leaders haven't done enough to keep uh, the economies together, and uh, I do fear that uh, we are going to see the Eurozone break apart. And, of course, as we've just been mentioning, uh, we could see the West's uh, share of global GDP sink below 50% over the next 10 years, or thereabouts. But, you know, of course, it is down to what's happening in Asia as well. So let's have a look at these Southeast a Asian economies here, doing very well. But we can't just lump them in one group, can we? Because each one has a different story to tell. No, I think... In Southeast Asia, one of the dramatic things is that the countries are very different from each other. Uh, they are getting increasingly integrated, and some of their issues are the same. But nevertheless, they are very different economies. You've got a high-growth economy like uh, Vietnam, which has got some inflation problems, but is benefiting very much from uh, low labor cost manufacturing. And then you've got a sophisticated economy like Singapore, where it's more like Switzerland, really. Uh, it's also it's growing quite quickly for a, 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 a prosperous economy, but it's got uh, different problems. It's got the problems of prosperity rather than the problems of inflation. Right. When we uh, look at this as well, just, uh, you know, what lessons do these ASEAN nations actually learn from what's happened with the Eurozone? I think the one thing that they should learn is not to try and put together a single currency. But I don't think there's much danger of that. I think the lesson from the Eurozone is that you could only have a single currency when you've got the economies moving more or less in line with each other. And trying to bring in the single currency too early doesn't really work. But the report that we're releasing today for the uh, Institute of Child Accountancy in Wales, what that is showing is that uh, the ASEAN economic growth is going to change gear and instead of being based so much on exporting and exporting to the West, where the markets are fairly weak, much more of it is going to be based on domestic consumption, uh, which is going to take over increasingly as a driving force in the region. Right. Well, you know what happens, though, if we see a, a sharp pullback in Chinese growth? What would be the ripple effect? It would be bound to be a ripple effect, um, but it will not be as great as the ripple effect might have been had this happened 10 years ago or so. Uh, at that stage, there was a very heavy dependence on external trade. What we're seeing, and particularly over the next five years, we're going to see a further change in this direction, is that domestic consumption in ASEAN is going to be much more the driving force. Right, you, you say that, but uh, what about intra-ASEAN trade here? How much does that grow by here with the different income levels, of course, playing a big role? Well, the countries tend to be more complementary than, uh, than substitutes. So you do get uh, uh, quite a lot of trade, and obviously you get particular trade when you're linking up uh, different economies with different types, with different uh, 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 core advantages. You've got Singapore with financial services, for example. Uh, you've got the commodities that come from various parts of the region, including Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, and you've also got the manufacturing uh, base, where different types of manufacturing happen at a, a different pace in the region. You've got pharmaceuticals in Singapore. You've got uh, uh, the low labor cost manufacturing in Vietnam, for example. And so that trade within the region is going to be a growing part, and it will grow especially rapidly as consumption in the region grows, as the region becomes more middle class. Doug, what is the biggest challenge of facing this part of the world? The biggest challenge is going to be, I think, coming from outside the region, which is coping with the weakness of the Western economies, the fact that the U.S. economy is growing relatively slowly, the Eurozone economy may not be growing at all, um, and what that will mean is that the local economies here are going to have to depend much more on their own resources. Uh, and I think they're going to do that. Uh, I don't think that's difficult. I think it's well understood. But clearly they can't make that adjustment without some uh, slowing down in the r very rapid rates of growth that we've had in the past. Uh, you seem really sanguine about inflation there. I think inflation, inflationary uh, forces are going to weaken in the coming year. 
Some of the things that kept up inflation have been supply side, like you know, the reduction of uh, Libyan oil production, uh, uh, the impact on the cotton harvest of uh, 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 reduced cotton production, and food prices as well. Those supply side factors are not going to be quite as uh, dramatic and negative uh, as we move on through the next 12 months. I think we'll see inflation come back a fair bit. Douglas, thanks a lot for, for joining us. Uh, Doug McWilliams uh, joining us uh, from Singapore from the CEPR.